Good. Okay. Well, I think we might just kick off, and then we'll see, um, and we'll see how we go. And um, thank you very much, uh, colleagues and friends, for joining us. Um, my name is Kenneth Tarrick. I'm in the Department of English and Related Literature, um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome. Um, Tristan Kay, uh, a colleague from Bristol, um, a former PhD colleague, in fact, uh, um, one, a while back at this stage um, in Oxford. It's a great uh, pleasure to welcome someone who works on quite similar stuff to me, <laughs> so which is also quite fun. And um, Tristan uh, Kay is a, a scholar of Dante and is now working on um, the, um, uh, turning attention more to the modern reception of Dante. He was an undergraduate and graduate student at the University of Leeds, so not far away, um, and uh, a, a DPhil student at the University of Oxford under the supervision of um, Professor Lele Malgragnolati and has since 2012 been at the University of Bristol, where he is now the senior lecturer in Italian. Um, so it's with great pleasure that um, he's the author of, I just do want to say he's the author of Dante's Lyric Redemption um, with OUP in 2016, which um, is a super read and my copy is full of post-its and stickies and things. So uh, uh, do, look, do read that. Um, and the project that we're going to hear about this evening is um, his ongoing research and his um, Leverhulme Trust funded research on Dante and the idea of Italy. So I'll hand over to you, Tristan, and thank you very, very much. Thanks so much, um, Kenneth. Can everybody hear me okay? Is that great? I'll, I'll share my screen now as well. Um, okay, I trust everyone can see that. A thumbs up. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Kenneth, um, for inviting me to speak to you uh, all in York today. And thanks to um, all of you for being here, whether in York or, or elsewhere. It's a real pleasure for me. Um, I want to present today some uh, reflections and some work in progress on the topic of Dante and the idea of Italy. And my focus is not going to be on how Dante conceives of Italia, though I will touch on that. Um, nor on his wider cultural afterlife in, in modern Italy, but specifically on how political agents have drawn on Dante in articulating and defining their visions of the Italian nation state. Um, few figures in world literature help, are more strongly associated with the nation and with literary nationalism than Dante. He is often cited as the father of the Italian language. He was zealously co-opted, as I shall discuss in this talk, by the architects of Italian unification and fascism, and he continues to be invoked in political discourse today. Hundreds of institutions around the world associated with the promotion of Italian language and culture bear the poet's name. Dante appears as a national symbol on the Italian two euro coin. Italy is the only country to select a literary figure to occupy this place. Dante retains moreover um, a strong presence in departments of Italian studies throughout the world with the Commedia, regarded as the national classic par excellence and the core of a traditional Italian studies curriculum. But in refer referring to the idea of Italy, I immediately want to highlight the mutable and the contested uh, reality of Italy and of, indeed of any nation state that lies beneath its illusion of coherence and solidity. Um, we are, of course, in an anniversary year for Dante. It's um, 700 years since his death in Ravenna in 1321. Um, but by way of introduction to my topic today, I want to begin with another anniversary, the celebrations in May 1865, marking 600 years since the birth of the poet. And this was a hugely significant and resonant event, occurring as it did in the immediate wake of unification in 1861, and just months after Florence was made the temporary capital of the new Italian nation, uh, Rome would remain part of the, the papal state until 1871. Um, this anniversary celebration was inspired in part by the German anniversary celebrations of the poet um, Friedrich, Schiller, Friedrich Schiller in 1859, and by a series of similar events um, commemorating literary figures 
in other European nations in the late 18th and 19th centuries as a new uh, idea of national consciousness um, emerged. The event was accompanied by the weekly publication of a newspaper in Florence, uh, Il Giornale del Centenario di Dante Alighieri, um, and I'm showing you here the um, first issue of that uh, giornale, um, with Dante's portrait located between the arms of Florence on the left and the, the House of Savoy on the right, right, that being the Piedmontese dynasty that ruled the Italian kingdom until uh, it was made a republic in 1946. Um, and you can see that both of them are illuminated by Dante's star uh, at the top of the image. And this um, encapsulates, I think, the powerful sort of municipal and national dimensions um, that coalesce with, with unique force in the figure of Dante in this 1865 uh, celebration. It could be simultaneously uh, a consummately Florentine and a consummately national event. Um, we can also see the heading um, just above the title, um, Honorate, just be between the title and the, the portrait, uh, Honorate l'altissimo poeta, it says. You might just about be able to make that out. Um, so, honor the loftiest poet. And these words in, in Canto 4 of Dante's Inferno are actually uh, directed by the, the School of Classical Poets at Virgil, um, who is presented as their most preeminent member. Um, but they become repurposed in this event in 1865 as a, as a sort of patriotic refrain with which to honour um, Dante. Um, as well as being attended by the, by the king, uh, Vittorio Emanuele II, and assorted dignitaries from around uh, the new Italy and from, beyond, from abroad, the three-day celebration saw tens of thousands of Italians from different social classes and from the length and the breadth of the newly unified peninsula descend on Florence to honour the memory of a poet who would be presented as the very embodiment of the new nation. The celebration saw the unveiling of the statue of Dante by Enrico Pazzi, which you can see there, um, which still stands, of course, in, in that um, square in Piazza Santa Croce in Florence. Um, the square saw a series of patriotic orations um, there was a, a proliferation of different publications, journalistic, academic, poetic, popularizing, an array of musical, theatrical performances, Dante-themed, um, various processions and galas. It was an enormous um, and very impassioned event. And an interesting um, eyewitness account comes from the British Dante scholar of the time, uh, Henry Clark Barlow who was invited to attend this, uh, this celebration and was knighted by the king while he was there for his scholarship on Dante. And Barlow's very evocative account describes the, the frenzied atmosphere that took hold of Florence uh, in, these, in these days in 1865. He says the city buzzed like an immense beehive. Hotel rates reached unprecedented levels. People were frightened of the enormous crowds. Dante souvenirs were sold on every corner. Uh, indeed, Barlow writes, whatever was said or sold or done had reference to Dante. So it's a real, a real sort of Dante mania that takes hold at, this, uh, at these celebrations. Um, and I think this event can be seen as the apex of um, a recuperation of Dante as a cultural and national icon um, over the course of the 19th century. And the convergence of some of the different currents of, of this during the uh, the, during the Risorgimento, so the kind of build up to uh, national uh, unification um, in 1861. Um, Dante had been appropriated um, by different sort of political movements by some, such as Ugolo Foscolo, Giuseppe Mazzini, who were eager to inaugurate a more secular nation state um, as a Ghibelline figure. So I'm referring here to the two political factions of Dante's own Florence, the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, the Guelphs who were broadly pro-papal, the Ghibellines who were broadly pro-imperial in the sort of power struggle that was taking place in medieval Italy. Um, so, the, so some appropriated Dante as a, as a Ghibelline, even though he'd been a, a Guelph politician, um, because Dante had angrily denounced the corruption and the political aspirations of late medieval popes in his Commedia. For others, so-called neo-Guelphs, uh, people like Vincenzo Gioberti, Cesare Balbo, who longed for a distinctively Catholic United Italy with the papacy at its helm. Um, Dante was the Guelph Florentine politician, 
uh, and the consummately Christian poets. And these readers would typically disavow the, uh, the imperial Dante. Um, Dante wrote a, a political treatise, the, the Monarchia, where he promoted um, the, the, the role of universal empire as a divinely uh, preordained um, system for organizing humanity. But common to these different strands of um, appropriation was a, a, um, is, a, is a sort of zealous vision of Dante as a poet whose writing prefigured and even prophesied the united Italian nation. And I'm just going to give a couple of um, particularly emblematic quotations um, that distill the Risorgimento cult of Dante. Firstly, um, this one by Cesare Balbo. Um, in his 1840 uh, Vita di Dante. Um, I'm going to read the, the translations because I know it's not a, it's going to, it's a, uh, an audience coming from lots of different um, disciplines. And um, therefore, not having been able to depict the life of the Italian nation, I shall attempt to portray at least that of the Italian who, more than any other, brought together the genius, virtues, vices, and fortunes of his country. He was at once a man of action and of letters, as our, our best were. He was a man of his party. He was then an exile, a wanderer, a poor man who drew new strength and new glory from adversity. He was, in short, the most Italian Italian that has ever lived. L'italiano più italiano che sia stato mai. Um, then we have Bernardino Zendrini uh, in a similar spirit. Dante is truly the prototype of the Italian people of that people to whom he gave, as Moses gave to the Hebrews, a particular physiognomy modelled on his inner image as a man and a citizen. And I believe I've not said too much when I say that the Commedia was to us, like the Bible to the exiled Israelites, a symbol of homeland and nationality in the years of foreign domination and universal despondency. And then referring to Henry Clark Barlow, who I mentioned earlier, Dante's great poem is to the Italians not only a manual of morality and theology and a textbook of political principles, but a mirror in which they themselves are reflected. His life was the life of the Italian Middle Ages, the history of a nation summed up in one man. Dante is the type of a whole people, the personification of Italy itself, when Italy was the center of European civilization, literature, science, and art. And although um, Barlow is not um, Italian himself, he's very much infused, I think, with the, the, um, the, the, the spirit of um, the Risorgimento cult of Dante. Um, so there's no less in these examples than an equation um, established between the poet, the nation, and the Italian uh, people. The Italian population is reducible to the figure of Dante. To honor the Altissimo Poeta is to honor the new nation in its unity and its integrity to celebrate its immutable qualities that extend through the centuries. The 1865 celebration sees Italy consecrated in the poet's name and in his image. Dante becomes not merely an instrument of nationalist discourse at this moment, rather he becomes its very vessel. And as uh, Bruno Tobia puts it, we witness un culto dantesco come sinonimo di culto patriotico. So a, a cult of Dante that is at the same time a cult of the nation. The two things become completely integrated. Um, and from this point in the newly unified Italy, alongside more sophisticated forms of creative and in intellectual engagement with Dante, there continues to um, an institutionalized top-down appropriation of the, of the poet in the name of Italy. To take just two examples, we have the foundation in 1889 of the Società Dante Alighieri, which I'll come back to again later, actually, um, established to uh, defend Italian language and culture. Um, as uh, Manes Yusfade puts it, she's written a very good book on the 1865 um, celebrations. Um, the 19th century directors of the Società resuscitated in the name of Dante their prin the principal ideal of the Risorgimento, the construction of a single idea of Italianness, with the figure of Dante, even more so than his literature, operating as a trope for the Italian essence as a whole. To take um, another example, we see the construction of numerous commemorative Dante statues and monuments, and some of these were erected in deliberately contentious locations where Dante was used as a means of staking out national territory. 
These include in uh, Verona, which you can see here, built in again in 1865 in the anniversary year before Verona was established as part of the uh, new Italy. It was sort of surreptitiously um, put up by uh, at night. Um, and in Trento in 1896, again, while it was under Austro-Hungarian control, where in, um, uh, and this was seen as kind of, this was commissioned in response to an 1889 statue of the German poet, uh, Volta von der Volkowied in Bolzano. So um, again, a contested site. Um, and that statue was then removed under fascism uh, by the Italians. Um, so what accounts for this um, extraordinarily uh, impassioned and intense uh, national appropriation of Dante? I'm going to jump back to Dante's own text um, for a moment now. Um, in the, um, there, there are clear reasons why, why his writing has, has represented such an important resource of, of, of meaning for the Italian patriots of the 19th and, and 20th centuries. Not only did Dante's creative genius inspire a fervent sense of pride, but his writings contained passages on Italia and the Italian language that proved highly suggestive. Um, this first example I've given um, in the Divine Comedy um, is taken from Canto Six of Dante's Purgatorio. Um, and this is where Dante's guide Virgil um, embraces his fellow Mantuan, the poet Sordello. And there is a pause in the narrative as Dante, the narrator, um, offers a trenchant uh, diatribe on the, the blighted condition of what he calls here Serva Italia, Italy enslaved. Um, the uncondition, un unconditional kinship shown in the embrace of Sordello and Virgil, you can see that here on the, the right of the image, the embrace of the two poets from different centuries whose, um, whose common city brings them a some instinctive sense of unity. Um, that stands in contrast with the corrosive factionalism of Dante's um, own day. Um, Italy, the garden of empire, but without an emperor in place, is cast as a nave sans nocchiere in gran tempesta, a pilotless ship in a fierce tempest tossed. Um, non donna di province ma bordello, not, not a mistress over provinces, but a harlot. Um, neglected by the absent emperor, German emperor Albert, whose who's um, election was not even recognized by the popes of the time and defined by political factionalism and um, discord and upheaval. Another key passage comes in the very first canto of the, the Commedia in the Inferno, where Virgil gives a prophecy of um, where he describes uh, an umile Italia, as Hollander translates it here, low laying Italy that will be saved, it will be liberated by a, a, a hound, a veltro in the second line there of the Italian um, that will free Italy from the scourge of what he calls the lupa. And this is an allegorical beast that, that embodies the, uh, the avarice, the cupidity, the corruption of the present day. And Dante's through Virgil here referring doubtless to the coming of an imperial ruler who will come and restore peace and order and unity and, and overcome all of this factionalism that defines um, Italy. Uh, in the Paradiso as well, uh, in Paradiso 30, um, Dante talks about the figure uh, of Henry VII of Luxembourg, who was Dante's great political hope at one point, who will come to save Italy uh, before Italy is ready to be saved, essentially. Dante thinks he could be the, the great imperial savior, but in reality, um, that, that his, his dreams aren't realized. Now, the, the, the geographical limits of Dante's Italia are set out in his um, linguistic and poetic uh, treatise, the, the De Vulgari Eloquentia, which he leaves unfinished. It's a treatise on vernacular language and vernacular poetry. Um, and it's a fascinating work for all kinds of reasons. Um, so Dante's Italy, uh, as we see here in the first quotation, is foremost a kind of linguistic entity whose regions are those in which the Italian branch of the Romance vernacular, what he calls the lingua del si, as in si being the word for yes, was spoken. And indeed, Italy is famously described, as you see at the top of the, the slide here, as il bel paese la dove il si suona, so the, the fair country in which the, the si um, can be heard 
resounds. Um, the lingua del si is nonetheless fragmented into myriad vernaculars, sometimes even within the same city. So you see the second quotation um, from the De Vulgari. Um, we must also ask why the people who live close together still differ in their speech, um, such as the Mil Milanese and the Veronese or the Romans and the Florentines, why the same is true of people who originally belong to the same tribe. And what is more still remarkable, what is still more remarkable, sorry, why it is true of people living in the same city, so the Bolognese of Borgo San Felice and those of Strada Maggiore. So there's, um, it's a story both of, of a kind of recognizable linguistic unity, but also intense fragmentation. Um, for the Dante of the De Vulgari though, the, these vernaculars, while they're all very, they all possess very substantial differences, um, they all possess what uh, Angelo Mazzocco calls elements of a quintessential Italian vernacular. And similarly, the different regions of Italy, Dante tells us, possess different customs from one another, um, while all sharing in a, in a supra-regional Italian identity, albeit one that he can only really define in very vague terms. Um, so the De Volgari sets out in the words of Mazzocco, a well-defined geographic entity with a linguistic and cultural, but not political unity. And even the linguistic and cultural unity has to be qualified. In his Convivio, which is a difficult work to define, it's broadly a sort of philosophical, political essay in the vernacular, a commentary on some of his poems. Um, he also vigorously defends the Italian language, the Italica loquella, against its detractors. And from those Italians who adopt other vernaculars, those who write in French or Occitan instead of, um, instead of it, their Italian vernacular. Uh, while the Commedia offers mordant political tirades against the, the French. So from our perspective today, we can, shaped really by the modern nation state, we can see how these various comments can combine, and there are of course others too, um, could resonate with the, the, the founders of the Italian uh, the nation. For the architects of unification, Dante's comments on Italia were proof that the nation had in fact long existed. It needed to be awakened and not uh, created. Um, yet on the evidence of Dante's own writings, his status as some kind of proto-national figure um, and a prophet of the un unified Italy demands significant qualification. After all, his political vision, as articulated across his later works, calls for universal empire as the means of transcending the factionalism of his age. The destiny of Italia for Dante is not as an autonomous nation, a sort of power container, but um, which would be sort of in competition with its neighbors, but instead as the Giardino dell'Imperio, the garden of empire, the political heart of a much bigger imperial um, superstructure. And while there can be no denying that Dante expresses pride in his language, his city, and in Italia, particularist sentiments and allegiances are all also strongly criticized in his Commedia. Dante promotes instead our common human purpose, and he attacks the folly of narrow forms of political affiliation and identification. And Dante states as the father of the Italian language, his place as a totem of linguistic nationalism and standardization is also a simplification of, of what's a very complex reality. What we today call Italian um, is, of course, a language based upon the, the literary Tuscan of the so-called three crowns, Dante, Petrarch and Boccaccio, but particularly Petrarch and Boccaccio, actually, um, as first standardized by Pietro Bembo in the 16th century. And of course, the value of a, a standard language for the, the 19th century nationalists was clear because it could, it could serve to instill a greater sense of coherence and fraternity among the Italian populace, of whom some two, only some 2.5% some at unification were said to have spoken what we now call Italian. And secondly, it would help instill in Italians a strong association of language, nation, and cultural patrimony. Dante's De Vulgari does indeed envision a, a supra-regional vulgare illustre, an, an illustrious vernacular, one that he imagines befitting, um, in, he imagines to uh, befit um, 
a sort of hypothetical pan-Italian court, which does not in fact exist. Um, yet the Devilgari simultaneously it pulls in different directions, really, because it also revels in that linguistic diversity that is the, the peninsula's reality. It's, it's a really valuable sort of linguistic document in terms of how he talks about the, the, the linguistic divisions of, of the peninsula. And the vernacular of the Commedia, of Dante's masterpiece, um, the work which was the focus of so much of this national pride, is ultimately a far more open and fluid and accommodating language than the more prescriptive vernacular which was imagined by the, by the treaties, the, the Devulgari. It's a language like the language of Adam described in the Paradiso in Canto 26, as um, a, it, it's a vernacular shaped and weathered by, by usage and time, not a language ever imagined to be a sort of pristine trans-historical standard language. And indeed, for this reason, Dante was quite unpopular in the centuries following the Commedia because his language was seen as kind of messy and unruly and quite experimental and extreme. So his reinvention as a kind of totem, as I say, of, of, of standard language and uh, linguistic nationalism is quite misleading. The, the Italian vernacular as set out in the De Volgari is also but one branch of a Romance language that was itself fragmented into three, into not just the lingua del si, Italian, but also Occitan and, and French. We look at this passage from the De Volgari, this is where Dante is giving examples of poetic, good poetic practice in the, in the vernacular. He doesn't just give examples, even though it's a, in some ways a, a, a treatise that strongly defends the Italian vernacular. Look at him here, switching between Italian and Occitan and Old French examples. Um, linguistic borders seem very faint. There was considerable porosity between languages and cultural traditions. Dante's own familiarity with French and Occitan liter literary cultures and the inspiration he takes from them is, is well known. The early Italian lyric in which he began his career as a writer is a kind of transplantation of the Occitan troubadour lyric. Um, Italian writers would adopt sometimes French and Occitan to write um, prose and poetry respectively. And the troubadour Arnaud Daniel, who speaks in Occitan in the Commedia, he's actually in the middle of the poem, he just he speaks in his native tongue. He's decide, described as miglior fabro del parlar materno, the, the finest craftsman of the mother tongue. So he's presented not as a, the best Occitan poet, but as the leading exponent of a kind of pan-romance, uh, multilingual vernacular tradition. Dante himself was also the likely author of a trilingual canzone, lyric poem. And all this is to say nothing of the, the linguistic, the cultural, the economic openness and porosity of Florence as a major European financial and economic hub. There can be no doubt then that Dante wrote suggestively about the cultural and linguistic territory of Italy, but the notion that he and his writing represent some kind of monolithic linguistic and cultural entity then impoverishes our understanding of the poet and of medieval culture. As John Lana writes in his History of Italy in the time of Dante, the truth is Italy at the time was nothing more than a sentiment or a literary idea. The reality was not unity, it was a mass of divided city, cities, lordships and towns dominated by particularist sentiments and local interests. Italy, states Lana, was a country in which only the literate lived, an awareness of which came from, he gives three, three sources, classical literature, xenophobic opposition to uh, external forces from further afield and from the rhetoric used to kind of um, repel them and from the experiences of exile from those Italians who went beyond the, 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 the peninsula. Now, I think an, an inspiring example of how we can think more productively about the intercultural complexities of medieval literary culture um, comes in a recent, um, relatively recent, it's, feels recent, but it's now five years old, um, Europe, a literary history edited by um, David Wallace. And this two volume history departs from many existing uh, stories of European literatures, which have overwhelmingly been national histories by offering an account that um, emphatically rejects the nation state as a means of um, inquiry. As Wallace puts it here in his introduction, as you can see on the slide, the notion of national literary history that still remarkably predominates today 
owes little to medieval understandings of natio and much to 19th century historiography, where the literary product of a particular place such as Palermo, Toledo or Toulouse is declared constitutive of a larger entity known or later known as Italy, Spain or France. And so rather than containing chapters on Italian or Spanish or French literature from the period in question, um, Wallace focuses upon cities grouped together into sequences or itineraries. Um, and these might reflect routes of trade or pilgrimage or language or cultural exchange. And Kenneth, in fact, was the author of um, an excellent chapter on Florence in this book. Um, and Florence appears in a, in a sequence which runs from Avignon to Naples. And um, for, uh, for Wallace, uh, he wants to show us with this that, um, uh, remind us of this, that much of the literature and much of the art that flows through France uh, is French inspired. We can't sort of draw a border between French, France and Italy because it would be, it would be hugely misleading in terms of the, 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 the development of its culture. Sequence six begins with Palermo and connects the Sicilian city to Muslim and Jewish communities in, in Iberia and in North Africa. And so by underlining how the, the cities of the Italian peninsula were shaped by contact with other sites and cultures and languages, the volume makes a very compelling um, case really for the inadequacy of critical approaches to medieval Europe that are sort of compartmentalized and that are shaped even implicitly by the borders of the nation state. As, as explored by um, Yasmin Yildiz on, on her work on nations and monolingualism, um, the 19th century conception of the nation state in whose service was Dan Dante was so powerfully appropriated is implicitly and in stark contrast with what we've just seen about York, medieval Europe, a monolingual one um, aimed at shaping nations as homogenous social and cultural entities and based, she says, on a reified conception of language. And this vision of the nation is premised on a, a correspondence of linguistic community and political unity. That's the kind of force which she argues lies behind much of the kind of conception of nations um, as they emerge in the 19th century. Um, according to Yildiz, this modern idea of the nation state, what Benedict Anderson describes as the most universally legitimate value in the political life of our time, has obscured multilingual practices across history. Um, with the advent of this monolingual paradigm that she describes, the notion of monolingualism rapidly displaced previously unquestioned practices of living and writing in multiple languages. Now, notwithstanding such scholarly insights and the important reflections on nations and nationhood carried out in recent decades by scholars such as Eric Hobsbawm and Benedict Anderson, Ernest Gellner, to, uh, to name a few, Dante's status as a, nation, a national poet, uh, while today, of course, more muted than in 1865, remains very persistent and can too often be left uninterrogated. We think of the 2021 um, celebrations, there's still often this rhetoric around Dante as national poet. It risks, however, flattening not only the myriad complexities of Dante's world, which I've just tried to describe, be they linguistic or social or political, and of Dante's own worldview, but also the multiplicity that defines Italy today as a, as a modern nation state. Um, and if there, are, there is obviously a diversity of approaches among the, the scholars I've just mentioned, but I think there were nonetheless some common themes um, that, that unite them in terms of how they've approached and how they've conceived of, uh, of nations in the last couple of decades. So firstly, the notion that, that national consciousness as we understand today, is really a product of the 19th century. Um, that it emphasizes the 19th century sort of national paradigm, um, a congruence of territory, language, culture, and people. And this is what Yildiz refers to really as the monolingual paradigm. Um, that this vision of the nation is, is very uh, potent, this image of unity and solidity, whether that be linguistic or cultural or racial in certain manifestations, um, but also illusory, it always masks a, a, a multiplicity that, that is always there. That nationalist discourse does not awaken a kind of national self-consciousness that, that was always there, but rather it creates it. And all of this has led to the rise of 
particularly in modern language studies, um, transnational approaches, attempts to recognise, uses a kind of starting point in scholarship, the notion that uh, nations as sort of discrete container cultures are not really very helpful um, lenses through which to explore cultures, that cultures are inherently um, interconnected. And lots of this is in transnationalism is pre pre premised on sort of modern globalization and the kind of migration and um, economic characteristics of the modern world. But I'd argue that a lot of the insights associated with that, that methodology can similarly be applied to the medieval world, which was incredibly uh, fluid and interconnected linguistically and culturally. Um, and I've just quoted here at the bottom, John Gillis, uh, national identities are like everything else. Uh, are, are, sorry, are like everything historical, um, constructed and reconstructed. And it's our responsibility to decode them in order to discover the relationships they create and sustain. Um, and I also just wanted to refer to this series of examples given by John Dickey in, a, in an essay on imagined Italy's, um, where he talks, he sort of applies the, uh, he offers a helpful sort of synthesis of some of this thinking on nationhood. Uh, and he gives four of the ways in which nations are often sort of created and sustained through a narrative, a tale of birth and struggles and triumphs, which isolates the nation's existence from passing circumstances. The idea that time has changed, but the nation remains the same thing. We've seen that already, I think, in those examples we've looked at from, from, from the, the, the time of the 19th century celebrations. Through symbols, again, the thinking of the, the statues that we looked at and so forth, through geographical space, the idea of self-esteem invested in territorial integrity, imagining the nation and the, the, the geographical space to be coterminous and Dante's account of the linguistic, uh, so the, 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 the geographical kind of parameters of Italy would be kind of justified, used to justify particular policies at times in the 19th century through setting the nation against things, so defining the we of the nation against foreigners and criminals and subversives, so that if enemies seem concrete, so will the nation. And it's with that that I want to turn to the, the fascist appropriation of Dante in the remaining time in my talk, um, where we find really the most extreme appropriations of Dante. Um, there's no single national event under uh, fascism to compare with the celebrations of 1865, but fascists were continually drawn to the poet as a source of ardent national pride. Um, he was invoked in fascist speeches, and from 1923, um, the reading of the Commedia was made mandatory in all educational settings except professional schools. The fascists identified intimations of the coming of Mussolini in the Commedia's prophecies um, of in reality, a sort of medieval imperial ruler. Um, at Zona Dantesca, so sort of Dantean zone area, was instituted in, in Ravenna, where Dante, um, where Dante died, where his remains are. Um, and the vast monument in Rome, the Danteum, which you can see a plan for there on the right, was endorsed by Mussolini, um, but never built. Um, you can also see here a card from the um, Società Dan um, Dante Alighieri with a, uh, a Mussolini quote and signature upon it. So it says here, defendere la lingua significa rendere sempre più potente l'unità spirituale e quindi politica della nazione. So defending the, the language means making ever more potent the political, the spiritual and therefore political unity of the nation, which I think encapsulates the, in some ways the, the risorgimento Dante as well, but certainly what we see in, in, in Dante, in, in fascist Dante. Um, so I want to turn now to a, a body of what I think we can call kind of fascist pseudo scholarship on Dante that emerges during this time. There's, there continues kind of serious scholarship on Dante during this period, but we also see a kind of um, an attempt to um, analyze and explore the poet through public sort of scholarly publications that promote a very fascist version of, the, of Dante. And I've been looking at some of these over the last few weeks, and I wanted to present some of my initial thoughts and findings associated with them. Um, and I think they, they not only sort of bring out his supposed national characteristics ever more forcefully, but see him also employed as a kind of opponent to internationalism and um, cosmopolitanism. And also, it's a, they're often very gendered. They often present Dante as a sort of model of fascist virility. 
And the first one I want to look at is this um, reading of Purgatorio VI, as I mentioned earlier, the canto of Serva Italia, Italy enslaved, a very uh, a canto that's described by Michael Caesar as being almost like a patriotic hymn during the Risorgimento, such was its uh, resonance. Um, and this is this has, this is a, uh, called Dante il fascismo nel, nel canto di Sordello. So Dante il fascismo and the canto of Sordello, the poet who we find there. Um, and it's published as a standalone reading of that of that canto. And it's a pub, it's accompanied by an approving foreword by the prominent fascist Italo, Italo Balbo. And um, it, it includes this, this uh, insert photo of the Duce Mussolini himself. Um, and it combines it's a strange combination of quite sort of bland conventional exposition of the content of the text with some incredibly assertive claims about Dante's credentials as a fascist. And we see here in the opening of the um, of, of the of the um, uh, of the reading that Dante is a fascist is demonstrated by all his works, constantly marked by a sense of profound love for his country and his sincere respect for the authorities and the laws. But above all, it's demonstrated by his divine comedy, which, especially in the Canto of Sordello, the sixth of the Purgatorio, reaffirms in a supreme way all the principles for which fascism was born and established. It's quite funny to see Dante seen as this kind of um, a deferential respect of authority, considering he's, in his Inferno he depicts contemporary popes kind of plunged into the ground in, in hell. Um, the Dante, though, is even, even um, imagined as, a, as an agent of fascist violence. So we look at this passage. Um, uh, were he alive today, uh, Jacopini is going to tell us, he would raise the fascist truncheon against the disruptive forces of socialism and communism. Um, so Dante is therefore the precursor of fascism. If he had lived in our time, he would surely have honoured us with his company, wielding his truncheon against all socialists and communists, renegades and disruptors of the nation, and against all those who, in the name of a degenerate liberalism, tolerate these deleterious elements, which, left to their own devices, would have ended up enveloping and overwhelming everyone and making Italy once again not a woman over provinces, ma bordello, but a harlot. So you can see there him quoting again Canto VI in the service of his fascist agenda, the idea of um, what Italy would have been but for Mussolini. It would have been that chaotic Italy of 1300. And the essay largely uses Dante as a pretext to attack what he calls international socialism. And I think one of the, as I say, one of the threads that connects these three examples I'm just going to talk about is um, that Dante is pitted less against other nations than, presented, than he is presented as a bulwark against internationalism. In, in Jacopini's case, international socialism, as he calls it. Um, Jacopini does show an awareness of Dante's unlikely status as an arch nationalist. He recognizes some might see the universal approach of Dante's imperial vision as a, pre a precursor for socialist internationalism, um, a doctrine whose defenders, Jacopini argues, see the entire world as their patria and not just the nation. But Jacopini places the universalism of the monarchia in opposition with the chaotico internazionalismo socialista, the, in, the chaotic international socialist internationalism. Um, that vision would subjugate Italy to another center of power, inevitably, Jacopini says, whereas Dante's vision of empire valorized Italy. It would see it as, um, it would see it as the, the, the worthy of governing the whole world. So the political vision of Dante thus becomes in Jacopini a precursor to an aggressive Italian imperialism rather than internationalism. Um, so he says Dante dunque e il fascismo sono entrambi imperialisti. Dante and fascism are both imperialist, he says, he declares. Now the next um, and the most extensive fascist study of Dante that, that I've come across so far is this one by Domenico uh, Venturini, Dante Alighieri e Benito Mussolini, published in 1932. And you can see the, 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 the fascists, the symbol um, at the bottom there. Uh, and having set out the preeminence of Italian culture and Dante as its greatest exponent, Venturini study, which is over 300 pages long, believe it or not, um, sets out a series of um, parallels between the poet and Mussolini and presents fascist solutions to the political prophecies of the Commedia. Um, while the work's content is propagandistic, as we might expect, its appropriation of Dante sees the, um, the national 
uh, vision of the poet pushed into new and disturbing directions. And I think, as I, as I mentioned, it uses Dante as an instrument of promoting a, a fascist vision of masculinity and virility. Um, Venturini often returns to a, um, an opposition we find in the second canto of the Inferno. And if you, if you uh, know Dante, if you know the Inferno, what you, you, you'll remember that what happens here is Dante, the character, um, is told by his guide, Virgil, of, of the justification for his journey. Um, he's feeling very anxious about going on this journey through the afterlife. He's filled with what, what's described as vilta, cowardice or fear. And Virgil instead passes on this message from Dante's beloved, who is sort of uh, in, in the Paradiso, who comes to visit him and tells him of the, the divine authority that lies behind his journey. And the impact of this is that Dante's vilta, his cowardice, is transformed into what he describes as um, ardire e franchezza. So um, sort of boldness and spiritedness um, fill his heart. So Virgil sort of rebukes him here and says, you know, what's the matter with you, basically? Why do you still have this vilta, knowing that God is on your side, basically? You should be, uh, you should experience, you should be filled with ardire e franchezza. And so there's, a, there's an opposition there spread out, set out between those two traits. Um, and this ardire e franchezza, which, who, who's awakening in a rather fragile Dante, the character, um, and that's described in this passage on your screen through a, a very tender simile of um, delicate fioretti, little flowers being awoken by the morning sun. They are distorted into instead inventorini, sort of descriptors of fascist virility. Okay, so if you look at this example describing the, 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 the march on Rome, the, the fascist insurrection of, of, of 1922, um, didn't ardire e franchezza give us that momentous march on Rome, which paved the way for the shining new history of Italy? So those, um, that courage awakened in, the, in Dante the Pilgrim to embark upon his divine journey is kind of uh, reimagined as the kind of motivating force for the insurrection of uh, 1922, the rise of fascism. Um, and I was especially struck by a, 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 a chapter entitled Dante, Strenuous Defender of the Glory of Italy, because this kind of works around a, a sort of polarity um, that, Dan, uh, that, that Venturini creates between Dante and Brunetto Latini. Now Brunetto Latini, some of you may be familiar with, was an important Florentine politician and diplomat, and arguably the city's preeminent intellectual figure for the several decades prior to his death in 1294. So he's died just before the date of the journey, of the, the imagined journey of Dante's Commedia. And Brunetto is kind of an interesting figure because he spent time in Spain uh, and while exiled from Florence in France, and he wrote his encyclopedic work, The Trésor in Old French, and he's a sort of mediating figure between French and Latin and Florentine cultural traditions. He also translated Cicero into the Florentine vernacular. And as you, you may know, as you can see in this image, Dante meets Brunetto in, in hell um, and is shocked to, to find him there. He's depicted among the, um, the Sodomites in Inferno 15. And he, he's, he's taken aback to find this figure of such prestige uh, deep in the inferno. And he, he struggles to reconcile his memory of what he describes as Brunetto's care buona imagine paterna, his kind paternal image. He's depicted as a father figure to Dante um, in this canto, a sort of defective father figure ultimately. Um, he can't reconcile that memory with the, with the sight of his scorched features here in hell, his cotto aspetto. And in both the representation of Brunetto and the four Florentines who appear in the following canto, Dante offers a very sort of ambiguous and rather sympathetic treatment of the, the, so, the Sodomites, which is not typical of the sort of um, the, the um, opprobrium typical of medieval culture in its representation um, of sodomy. Um, but the ambiguities that are associated with Dante's Brunetto are completely erased in Venturini. It becomes a, a very hostile um, account of Brunetto. Um, and because where, where Dante inspires fulsome and constant and hyperbolic praise, Brunetto it, it receives quite sort of unpleasant derision. See here, Brunetto for Dante was an evil Italian, a man without discretion, a malicious, 
boastful, envious, cowardly man from whose meretricious mouth no wise, would ever, wise words could ever come out. And because he was so horrified, Dante placed him in hell. And the words in italics in the, uh, the Italian here are, are actually used by Dante in, in talking about the abandonment of one's vernacular. These are the reasons why you might abandon your Italian vernacular. It might be vainglory or envy or a lack of judgment or viltà, that word we've just seen, the idea of sort of a lack of courage in your own, a lack of a failure to stand up for your own vernacular, I think, in this case. Um, and all of this for all of this in the convivio for, for, for Venturini is all about Brunetto, which it could be because Venter, Brunetto was perhaps the most famous uh, betrayer, betrayer of the of the Florentine vernacular of Dante's time, but it's probably a broader judgment. Um, now, Viltà, um, we see in the second quotation, um, questa Viltà deve aver messo, sorry, uh, this cowardice must, must have inspired a great scorn in that proud and ferocious soul of Alighieri. So the Viltà, which is that word we saw in Canto 2, which was placed in opposition to the, the fascist qualities of ardire e franchezza, um, here we also have fierezza, brave, the proudness of Dante. Um, we see associated that cowardice with Brunetto as a sort of abandoner of, um, of, of his own language. And as the chapter proceeds, we have a kind of, what, what's been a kind of implicit alignment of Dante and Mussolini as opponents of a kind of suspicious form of multilingualism becomes much more explicit. So Dante calls cowardly um, and pusillanimous those writers who prefer foreign languages to their own, considering them superior, are magnificent duce, like Alighieri, a strenuous advocate of the glories of Italy, has been able to break the cowardice of spirit, the pusillan pusillanimity, I always really struggle to say that word, of the abominable uh, villains of Italy, who um, despise their own country, reawakening in the Italian people a consciousness of their national dignity sadly dulled by a supine and cowardly admiration of, of foreigners. So we have a, a typically fascist dichotomy here between the sort of robust and the virile patriot uh, defending Italy's language and culture, once embodied by Dante and now by his heir Mussolini, and this itinerant multilingual cosmopolitan figure of Brunetto, whose uh, loyalty to his nation so-called and language are presented as being as weak as Dante's are strong and unwavering. And it comes as no surprise that uh, Venturini's condemnation of um, Brunetto extends to his association in Dante with sodomy. Um, Venturini claims that in a passage from, uh, in a work entitled the Patafio, which was once but no longer attributed to Brunetto, he claims that um, il, uh, the filthy Florentine Ilaido Fiorentino offered an apologia for, for sodomites. Um, and in excusing sodomy, Venturini describes Renato as uh, the public corrupter of morals. Um, and this comes to, um, and argues this accounts for his place, not in purgatory, but in hell. And this leads to Venturini's final fascist sort of exploitation of Brunetto, which is as a kind of obscene and scurrilous writer of the kind who might corrupt public morals. And in this, Venturini associates Brunetto with scrittori osceni e plebei, sort of, of, um, of obscene writers of the fascist era, whose works subver subverted traditional Christian morality. Venturini associates Brunetto in this with atheists, Freemasons, and the sexually non-conforming, those who, as Venturini puts it, wanted the triumph of a bestial sexuality and the disappearance of every moral sense. Um, and for Venturini, just as Dante placed in hell the sodomite Brunetto, so Mussolini suppresses and censors the degeneracy, the corrupting influence of those non-conforming groups through his severi provedimenti legislativi, his severe, his harsh uh, legal measures. So censorship is associated here with Dante's, the, the sort of uh, meeting out of, of justice through law in Mussolini, justice in quotes, uh, is, is aligned with sort of Dante's divine justice. And there's more we might say about uh, Brunetto in, in Venturini. I think it's very interesting, this use of this particular figure who becomes the kind of embodiment of, um, of, of so much that was kind of seen as anti-fascist. Um, but I was 
especially interested in the relation how how the relationship between Dante and Brunetto, which is such a rich and comp complex one, um, becomes um, uh, an extreme polarity used to reinforce a conception of masculinity that's so central to, to fascist discourse. Brunetto becomes a kind of treacherous and decadent cosmopolitan whose dangerous departure from a fascist norm of language and politics and sexuality must be controlled and contained by the law. And Dante, by, by contrast, becomes the virile patriot and upholder through his poetry of linguistic, cultural and sexual norms. And I want to see if this was found anywhere else, whether there was a kind of uh, any references elsewhere to Brunetto as a kind of anti-fascist. And I found this one, the only one I found so far, there may well be more, Carlo Scorza, um, fascist party secretary, who, who talks about Brunetto here. Um, it's up to, it's necessary for all of the men, those who are really men of the fascist race, to dedicate themselves to straightening the spine of the feeble bodies and all of the descendants of Signor Brunetto Latini. So we see Brunetto once again here used as um, a kind of opponent of nationalist virility, as um, a progenitor of what's presented as a sort of weak and effeminate uh, anti-fascism. Now it will come as no surprise that, to, to, coming towards a conclusion, that Dante uh, in opposition, it, the use of Dante in opposition to internationalism and socialism and cosmopolitanism through Brunetto leads to an anti-Semitic uh, Dante in the era of the racial laws in Italy introduced in 1938. And Judaism was often combined with Bolshevism and Freemasonry in sort of 30s fascist discourse. And in an essay, um, a book of um, essays marked to, uh, collected to mark the, the anniversary of the Dante Society of Salerno in Southern Italy, um, among some quite descriptive issue, um, essays on the, on the society's activities, we find an essay called Dante e il problema ebraico, Dante and the Jewish question or the Jewish problem by a magistrate a, a named um, Enrico Giovanni. Um, you see the, the cover of the, of the book here, um, Dante, uh, of course, on the, in the middle, and also the again the fascist symbol there. Um, so you can see how the society has become a sort of agent of fascism by this point. Um, now, Giovanni draws on familiar anti-Semitic tropes in his short essay, and he recalls a, a, the attack on Ebraismo Mondiale, global Judaism, at the Grand Fa at the Grand Council of Fascism in uh, October 1938, which I quoted here on the screen. The actual um, quotation from the from the from the meeting when the racial laws were uh, introduced, um, and we see here that that that, that um, the, the, the 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 deteriorating mood of the Italian Jews is 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 claimed um, towards the fascist regime, which they did not sincerely accept because it was antithetical to the psychology, the politics, and the internationalism of the Jewish people. So it seems to be again the internationalism or the or the international or the anti national character. Um, and associated uh, supposed kind of weakness of the allegiances of its people that's being uh, impugned here. And to support this idea of a sort of uh, this anti-Semitic agenda, um, Giovanni quotes um, Paradiso V from Dante's Commedia, where, where um, Beatrice, Dante's guide in paradise, speaks to Dante about free will and the importance of Christians maintaining the vows they make. And she says they must not like, act like mad sheep lacking discretion uh, in this quotation, but they should, they, should, they should show human resolve in adhering to their vows. Yes, lest their Jewish neighbor, um, despite lacking the guidance provided by the New Testament, may mock them uh, from a, a position of moral superiority. So um, be men, not maddened sheep, lest the Jew there in your midst make mock of you. Um, now, Teodor Linda Barolini in her gloss on this passage rightly highlights the ambivalence that characterizes it with respect to its treatment of Jews, because um, she, writes that she, she, she writes that Dante seems to be suggesting that a Jew who strictly observes the law of the Old Testament may do better than a Christian who wantonly makes vows and breaks them. On the other hand, she notes there is a kind of unsavory dimension because there's a sort of rivalry posited between the Christian and the Jew, um, uh, not as, and they're not presented as, as progenitors of Christianity, but rather as sort of rivals for God's attention in a way. Um, but it comes as no surprise that Giovanni's reading of this terzina from the poem is a conspicuous distortion. Um, you can see the quotation here at the bottom, the poet exhorts 
distinguishing um, the noble Florentine people from the Jews be men and not mad sheep. So he seems to be conflating the, the Jews with the mad sheep, which is not, as my understanding, what Dante is saying here. Um, lest the Jew, ready to stir up and deepen discord, may laugh at you. And again, the, the clause about the stirring up and deepen discord is completely absent in the original text. So it's a kind of, um, it's a complete misappropriation of the original. He also completely ignores the first line of the Terzina. Um, and in the recent Oxford Handbook of Dante, um, Lino Pertile, in his essay on Dante and the Shoah, has um, drawn attention to the use of Dante here in the, 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 the fascist pamphlet, um, La Difesa da Razza, the defense of the, the Italian race. And you see there in the square, just below the title, the use of a Dantean quotation in each case, the, uh, including this one about the, the, um, the Jewish figure in Paradiso V, but also one on the confusion mixing of races that, that in Canto 16 that, that, that the fascists drew, sort of seized upon. Um, so I find it extraordinary in the, against this backdrop that, um, and testament to the true power of Dante's poetry to transcend the, the extreme ideology imposed upon it during these years, that um, in Primo Levi's Sequesto en Uomo, his account of his incarceration at Auschwitz, Dante becomes an incredibly potent resource of meaning, and in one chapter becomes a momentary force of sort of psychological liberation for him. And in a recent essay, Catherine Keane has talked about the use of Dante and Il Alighieri as nom de guerre uh, among resistance partisans. So you can see there this attempt to reclaim the poet and with him kind of the nation, the national identity. So um, to conclude, the, um, the examples of 1865 and, and fascism are, of course, particularly extreme uh, ones uh, in terms of where a national appropriation of Dante can lead. But I think they also raise important questions about how frequently one continues to view Dante through an implicitly national frame. Um, and nations are, after all, to quote Umut Ozkimirli, the taken for granted context of everyday life, the most readily available cognitive and discursive frame to make sense of the world that surrounds us. Um, by approaching the poet within the context of an Italian studies degree, for, for instance, as you know, my students do, um, I think they can easily be given the impression of a kind of national solidity um, in Dante, especially because his national kind of connotations are so numerous, but that can generate an unwelcome leveling of the complexities of, of Dante's world. Um, a few weeks ago, um, we hosted in Bristol a, um, a conversation with the editors of the, the, the Oxford Handbook of Dante that I just mentioned. And they talked about their attempts to, to work against what they call a monumental Dante, um, characterized by wholeness, linearity, and a sense of teleological progress in his writing towards this kind of perfect monument that is the Divine Comedy. Um, and they, they, they challenge what the editors describe as this idea of an overly consistent Dante. Um, and they, they offer an invitation to consider instead the tensions, the instabilities, the contradictions that might exist within his work. But I think teleology, this idea of working towards a kind of perfect realization of Dante, um, is, con is, is relevant not only to Dante's corpus, but also to, um, to his reception. And I think nowhere is this more pronounced than in his national reception. Um, Dante becomes um, posthumously um, a protagonist, perhaps the protagonist of the teleology of unification, of fascism, of nationhood. And the prophecies of, the po of his poetry are even presented as completed, fulfilled in the events of the 19th and 20th centuries, as extremely tele teleological. Um, but the, the national idea in whose name he has so often been invoked is not something linear and monolithic, but rather something like Dante's poetry, open to continual interpretation, debate and reconfiguration. The national cult of Dante needs to be examined critically as an evolving discourse in its own right. One that says far more about the self-image and the self-presentation of particular political agents at particular moments in history than it does about Dante. Better understood the diverse uses of Dante in the name of Italy over the last two centuries, while usually intended to demonstrate the nation's essential immutable qualities that extend through centuries, instead attest to, his contested, to the nation's contested and historically contingent character. And as a, as a corrective to the fascist vision of Dante I've been looking at, I want to include a, a, a um, to, to, to finish off with a passage from the poet's own 
devil guardi eloquentia and i'm not saying that this is any kind of definitive dante either but i just think it, it's, it's an attempt to show the the multitudes that his work contains so this is dante speaking as an exile to me however the whole world is a homeland like the sea to fish and while for my own enjoyment there is no more agreeable place on earth than florence when i turn the pages of the volumes and of poets and other writers by whom the, by whom the world is described as a whole and in its constituent parts i'm convinced and firmly maintain that there are many regions and cities more noble and more delightful than tuscany and florence where i was born and of which i am a citizen and many nations and peoples who speak a more elegant and practical language than do the italians thanks very much and sorry i've, I've gone on Thank you very much, Tristan. We can uh, give you a, a virtual applause. I turned on my my microphone in order for that to be heard. Um, Marvellous. Um, Thank you very much. It was a very 